So, let's take a look at this. First equation. Starting with our balancing, what should we do? Count our elements. Copper. Left and right, what do we have? Balanced? What do we do next? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Left? Right. Doesn't balance. What do we got to do to fix it? Next? Why can we balance nitrate and not nitrogen and oxygen? The nitrate stayed the same in both cases. Okay, as long as we have nitrate on both sides, we can do it as a complex ion. How many nitrates on the reactant side? Six. What is nitrate? NO3. This 2 applies to the parentheses. How many nitrates are there? Six. 2. The 3 is as much a part of the formula of nitrate as the U is part of copper. Okay. Copper is not carbon and uranium. Okay. So that 3 is just like the U. That's what makes it nitrate. So I cannot multiply that through. Everything within those parentheses is now my nitrate. There are two nitrates on the reactant side, and there are two nitrates on the product side. Do my uh, is it balanced? Let's just try that. Yeah. Okay. So as far as the elements go or atoms go, it's balanced. So the last thing that we should do, because we're already suspicious, oh, this guy's a jerk. He's going to ask me about redox reactions, is check charge. What is the charge on the reactant side? Zero. How do you know it's zero? zero. Nothing in the upper right-hand corner for both of those. So we got a zero. For the product side? Zero. Zero. So it's not that we, have, that we can ignore charge. Charge is still involved in this, just like hydrogen was involved in balancing our, our atoms, or our, our atom across our equation. But it's already balanced, so I don't have to worry about it. So if I look at my equation, I can now sum the coefficients. I can say how many nitric acids are present. We can do all sorts of fun questions off of that balanced equation. Okay? Questions on that one? Yeah. Okay. So the next one is the trickier one. So we'll go through the exact same process we've been doing. Aluminum. How many aluminums on the reactant side? One. On the product side. One. Coppers. One. And? One. One. So we say, oh, it's balanced. Before we do that, check the charge. What's the charge on the reactant side? Charge on the product side? Do our charges balance? No. So this means that we need to come up with some way to account for balancing this. How you go about doing that is kind of up to you. I showed you one method, this half reaction method. So what I'm going to do is split my reaction. Which one was oxidized or reduced? Never mind, I just figured it out. I was trying to color code tonight. Copper plus 2 goes to copper. Is that equation balanced? What do we need to do? We need two electrons. Where do we put them? Why do we put them on the reactant side? Charge on the reactant side? Charge on the product side? That's why we put our electrons on the reactant side, to balance out our charges. Start with, was it aluminum to aluminum plus three? Yeah. Is our reaction balanced? Uh, yeah, no. No. no, our charge isn't balanced. So, what do we need to do? Three we need three electrons, and we should put those three electrons the on the product side. If we now added this up, what would our result be? Copper plus two plus aluminum goes to copper plus aluminum plus three plus one electron. So I already canceled out the electrons. We now have an electron sitting as a product. Is that allowed? No. no. So we have to go back to our equations and come up with some way to make sure that our electrons cancel. With the method that we've been coming up with, it is pretty much just guess and check. One person said, okay, well, I need more electrons on the product or the reactant side to cancel out with those three electrons. So I'm going to multiply this one by two. Okay. 
what does that work as? I then get four electrons as a reactant, plus two copper plus twos, plus aluminum, going to copper, what is that? Oh, just copper. Two copper, thank you. Plus aluminum plus three, plus three electrons. What happens? I can cancel my electrons, and I get an electron now as a reactant. Well, I fixed my product, but now I get electrons as a reactant. Oh, crap. What do we do? Keep going back and try and figure out your common place where those electrons cancel. One option, what we're trying to do is make sure that the electrons on the reactant side equal the electrons on the product side. What is a common multiplier between 2 and 3? 6. Six. How do I get 2 to equal 6? Multiply by 3. How do I get 3 to equal 6? Multiply by 2. The result, 6 electrons plus 3 copper plus 2s plus 2 aluminum goes to 3 coppers plus 2 aluminum plus 3s plus 6 electrons. Six electrons cancels each other out, so I'll go ahead and erase. Uh, let's not erase those. Let's cross them out. It's more satisfying, right? Cross them out. You get to make sound effects, too. Okay. Our electrons cancel out. So what should we do? Check your work. How many aluminums? Two. Two and? Two. How many coppers? Two. Three. 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 And? Three. 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 What's the charge on the reactant side? We got six. Six because of our copper and our aluminum contributes nothing. On the product side, does our charge balance? So our equation is balanced. We now have our final balanced equation. Back to the question at hand. How many electrons were transferred in the course of this reaction? What we're trying to get at is where did everything come from? Where did everything go to? To convert copper plus two into copper, how many electrons did we need? We needed just two to do that, but how many times did we run that reaction? Three times. So how many electrons did copper plus two ultimately consume in the course of this reaction? Six electrons. Where did those six electrons come from? came from the aluminum converting across to aluminum plus three. Okay. So how many total electrons? I'm fishing for the wrong answer. So you can either six. give me the wrong answer or you can give me the right answer. Six. Still six. Okay. It's not 12 because it's just six being produced in one place and six being consumed. The exact same six being consumed in the other. Okay. So in this Question, I see your hand. Multiple choice answers. This is where it gets fun. Two, three, four, nine, uh, six, nine. I don't know. I just made some number up. There's almost always one answer that just doesn't make any sense. You'll notice that what two answers showed up that are misleading? Two and three, because in the half reactions, those happened. Okay, actually, I can come up with another misleading answer. Just changed my mind. Okay. Two and three show up in the half reactions. We add two and three, we get five. Does it make sense to add those two numbers? Absolutely not. But if you're a random student that has no idea what's going on, you now potentially put that answer down because you say, oh, 2 plus 3 equals 5. Well, 100 plus 100 equals 200. Right. doesn't mean that's the answer. Right. You also get it from the charges. They just get the charges. And you could also get it from the charges. So it comes down to understanding exactly what's happening. To figure that out, the easiest way, at least for me personally, is to show the half reactions. How many questions can you expect like this? So it's your call. One out of 30 questions, eh. You have a problem with it? Who cares? Guess, move on. Okay. Because you know it will take time. The answer was six. 
Is that a question? Maybe a question. Okay. Um, so, and the final thing that we get, that still has to be balanced with the elements and the charge. The elements have to be balanced and the charge has to be balanced. So when we balance equations, always the same thing. Elements and charge, elements and charge, all the way through. Okay. Deep breath, carry on. Back to chapter 7, double replacement reactions. Right? In a double replacement reaction, we are exchanging two ions. Fun thing with the double replacements is just like the single replacements, you are expected to predict your products. So, you want to do one example, or you guys want to crank these out on your own for the moment? Let's just do it. I'm not quite sure what that means. <laughs> on your own, or with me? Yes. Yes. I think I heard it with me. Yes. Barium chloride reacts with uh, potassium chromate. Ugh. I don't know. We'll find out. No, I mean, that doesn't I haven't written anything yet. Oh. So we need to convert our equation from text into symbols. Symbol for barium. Symbol for chloride. This is where it can get nasty. You should include your phases. Reacts with, meaning plus potassium chromate, symbol for potassium, symbol for chromate, to produce. Okay. Before we actually look at that, one of the things we want to evaluate is make sure our formulas are correct. Is this the appropriate formula for barium chloride? And how do you know? Yeah. All the way back to nomenclature. Check the charges. What is the charge on barium? Charge on chloride? One. Chloride's a minus one. Our for is our formula balanced? No, we need two chlorides to balance out the barium. Potassium chromate, charge on potassium. Plus one. Plus one, charge on chromate. Thank you, that's what I thought too. I wasn't sure though. Negative two, is it balanced? K2. We need two potassiums to balance out the chromate. In our double replacement, we're going to exchange our ions. Which ions do you want to exchange, the positive ones or the negative ones? Yes. Okay, I heard positive ones. Ultimately, it does die. Well, guess well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I'll exchange the positive ones. So I want potassium first with chloride. And I want uh, barium with my chromate. Before we continue on, you got to make sure your formulas are balanced. Is the formula balanced for potassium chloride? We know that because potassium is plus one, chloride is minus one, balanced. Charge on barium, plus two, charge on chromate, minus two, is that formula balanced? Yeah. Now that our formulas are balanced, we can balance the whole equation. So to go through and balance the whole equation, how many bariums show up on the reactant side? One. How many on the product? One. one. How many chlorides on the reactant? Two. Two on the product? One. one. How do we fix it? Put a 2 in front for our coefficient. How many potassiums on the reactant? Two. How many potassiums is a product? Two. How many chromates? One, one and one. one. What do we do? One. Check it. Do it again. Okay, and do it again. Make sure it balances out. And we should be getting this to balance out. Okay. Extra little pieces of information that come out of this. In all honesty, I'm not positive on this one, but I think it's right. What did I just add to my equation? Phases. How did I know those phases? What was the phase on potassium chromate? Oh, sorry. That was actually in the equation. I told you it was aqueous. How did I know the phases on my products? <laughs> That's a, a bit ego inflating. There are rules. 
on deciding whether you have solid compounds or aqueous compounds. You are responsible for those rules. So what you would need to go through and do is do your double replacement reaction, look at your products, and then check the rules to decide should that be aqueous or should it be a solid. Okay, so you would need to know those rules. Since you don't know those rules quite yet, finish the second one for me, get it balanced out. Uh, and for the sake of recording, try if you didn't get it done. It's like, thanks, Dad. Okay, we do the exchange. We'll swap this time the negatively charged species. So I'm going to end up with sodium with nitrate. Why did I not just switch over a nitrogen and an oxygen, or just nitrogen by itself? Because it's nitrate. Good answer. Okay, it's nitrate that's being shifted in our double replacement. Plus lithium chloride. Should check all of our formulas to make sure they're balanced. Sodium is a plus one. Chloride minus one. Lithium plus one. Nitrate minus one. Sodium plus one. Nitrate minus one. Lithium. What does that mean? All of our formulas are balanced. Now that all of our formulas are balanced, what can we do? Fair enough. You should check your formulas. <laughs> I was actually going to reference the equation. You should now balance the equation, and you see the equation is balanced. So then you can go through and check that, but you do have to check the formulas too. Question. I don't know if it's really relevant, but the nitrate, wouldn't that be in parentheses? So this is something that I've been hearing floating around that I'm not too sure where it's coming from. The only time you need parentheses is if you are trying to separate numbers away from each other. How many nitrates are there on both sides of the equation? One. There is no need to put a parenthesis in. For kind of grouping sake so that you understand that that is nitrate and it is one unit, you can use the parentheses. Technically, by drawing that, you're wrong. Well, I think oh, sorry. Thank you. Thankfully, your exam is multiple choice, so who cares? Okay. Except that you didn't learn that from me. Uh, I'm not showing you parentheses, because you take that into other classes, they may get mad back at me. I didn't show you that. All right. So the parentheses are helpful to group so that we understand they're part of a group, but you should not include the parentheses if you don't have a multiplier on whatever that is. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> Last part of this, the part that you probably nobody got, or maybe somebody got, sodium nitrate is what phase? Nobody? Okay. Lithium chloride, also aqueous. So in the environment or in the situation where you end up with your products both being aqueous, guess what? No reaction occurred because there was not a strong enough interaction between any of those elements to cause a reaction. That last one typically gets referred to as no reaction, and we end up not drawing out the products. Right? Kind of a bit odd, and again, it depends on what we're trying to do. Just like with the single replacements. With the single replacements, I told you to draw out the reaction. Predict it anyway, then evaluate should the reaction have occurred. Same thing's happening here. Draw out your reaction for the double replacement, then check your rules and decide, is it no reaction or not? I saw a hand from Pierre what's, first. What's the rules for uh, states? Come back to that in a second. So yes. it doesn't have a precipitate, I guess? So in this case, there is no precipitate for the second equation. So what are the rules? How do we know whether it's aqueous or solid? Please say it's, oh, okay, there are some answers. He asked more answers. Okay, we have to know, there it is. <clears throat> These are your solubility rules that your textbook gives you. Okay, officially, you are required to know all of these. Feel free to quiz me on them. <laughs> You'll find I don't know most of them. Okay, that's because you don't need to know most of them. The chemists that know a lot of these are constantly working with these ions to know the solubility differences. The big ones that you should know. <coughs> Excuse me. Number one, alkali metal ions and the ammonium ion are always soluble. Number two, acetates are always soluble. Jeez. And number three, I would actually say. Nitrates are always soluble. Of those, the only two that I actually really remember are one and three. You should know two anyway, but those three, absolutely, hands down, you need to know. Right? After that, there's, what, seven other rules. Guess how many of those other seven I have memorized? 
Absolutely none of them. Okay. Why? Exception. 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 Okay. I hate exceptions. Okay. Which means I don't memorize those because there's too many things that tell me that's the opposite. I've encountered plenty of people that have memorized these and know exactly what's happening with them. If you choose to memorize those, that is your choice. By all means, go ahead and do it. I do not expect you to have those memorized. The three that I do expect you to have memorized are those first three. Okay. After that, I will provide you a, some version of this table to help you predict those. Okay. So I think there was a question. So if it's soluble, a good point. Soluble means dissolves in water. What is aqueous? Dissolved in water. Insoluble means not dissolved in water, which means solid. Officially not aqueous, as far as we're concerned in this class, it means solid. Okay? Uh, they do pop up. So there are some compounds that are insoluble that will be specified as liquids. There are some compounds that aren't soluble that would be specified as gases. Production of CO2 almost always is written as a gas, not as aqueous. Does it have some solubility? Yeah. That's why we have sodas and they are fizzy. Right? It's the CO2 being dissolved in that solution. And they're fizzy because the CO2 is starting to come out of the solution. Okay? So... Those you're not responsible for on a test. I think I have seen a few of those show up on lab assignments. Okay? So you may have to see the gases and the liquids pop up on those. So watch out for them there. Uh, if they don't fall on the list, it's probably because it's a gas or a liquid. Not that we're not going to have these thoroughly memorized, but do we notice any trends um, based on the formula? Like what it starts with, ends with, anything like that? <clears throat> if you find one, let me know. <laughs> So, it took me longer than it would you, but okay. Yeah. So when it comes down to memorizing trends, I, this is something I freely admit, will tell anybody, I do not memorize stuff. I have a passion against it. Came to organic chemistry. Organic chemistry does a nomenclature thing as well. I noticed it took 10% of the grade. First time I took organic chemistry, I withdrew from it because I was doing horrible and failing and utterly. Okay. Second time I took it, I was like, I have to change my perspective on it. I looked at how much point value was assigned for naming compounds. 10% of your grade was due to nomenclature. I'd still pass. Okay. Anytime <laughs> nomenclature showed up on the exam, guessed and moved on. Spent no time studying nomenclature <laughs> whatsoever. Okay. The issue with that is you have to be willing to accept that loss. My grade in the class was a B with a percentage of 89.5%. Oh. Okay. What a professor. You accept your losses. Okay? That's my fault. I accept it. I'll move on. So if you decide that it's worth your time to try and memorize those trends or find trends within it, by all means, go ahead and do it because you don't want to accept those losses. I'll tell you, I don't think it's important, at least for this class. You may need to worry about it if you take 151 or it might show up in 152 too. Okay? Use the chart in your homework, you'll be fine. Okay? Questions on reading the chart? Nope. Okay. Last one is neutralization reactions. Take a look at that format for me. Neutralization reaction is also... It's not single replacement a double replacement. We exchanged A and B from what they were originally bound to. It is a double replacement reaction. It is a very specific type of double replacement reaction because we are starting with HA, which if we added our phases, would be known as an acid. What do we know about acids? They burn. They burn. Because everybody knows kind of universally that acids burn, we separated out the acid-base reaction as its own type of class of reaction because it was one of the first things discovered and manipulated when we dealt with chemistry. So they get referred to as neutralization reactions, not double replacements. Okay? So when we look at a double or 
neutralization reaction, we're mixing an acid with a base. As far as you're concerned, how do you know you have an acid? Hydrogen. Hydrogen? Where's the hydrogen? In front. In front. It's and it's aqueous. Now you know you have an acid. Yeah. How do you know you have a base? But it's not, not quite. Base has OH. Keep it as simple as that. Are all base, do all bases have OH? No. Are all acids because they have a hydrogen in front of the formula? No. How do you decide whether they're acids or bases? Talk to me in two years when you're taking organic chemistry with me. It'll be fun. We'll explain that. No. I was going to say hydroxides. Hydroxides is our standard for our, our bases, okay, which is OH. Okay? So if we're going to predict the complete neutralization of sulfuric acid with potassium hydroxide, formula for sulfuric acid, first thing I should write? H, good call, followed by? Why SO4? Not quite. So ick and eight kind of tie to each other, but I could just as easily write this, and I'm still going to get sulfuric. That would be sulfurous. Nope. No. It would still be sulfuric. Hydro. Hydro means a binary acid. There is no hydro, which means I'm looking at a ternary acid. It's hydrogen with sulfate. That's how we know. Plus... Potassium hydroxide, KOH. Check your formulas. Charge on potassium. Plus one. Plus one. Hydroxide, minus one. Charge on sulfate. Way to jump in there. Whoops. Let's try that again. Minus two. Charge on hydrogen. Plus one. Plus one. Are our formulas all balanced? No. no. We need to fix the H2SO4. We need two hydrogens. We do our replacement. Okay, we will exchange the potassium for the hydrogen. So we get KSO4, and we'd end up with HOH. Okay, we'll address that in a second. What's the charge on potassium? Plus one, charge on sulfate. Minus two, not balanced. Fix that with the two. It is also aqueous. How do we know it's aqueous? Because you memorized those solubility rules already. Good job. Okay. HOH, charge on hydrogen. Plus one, charge on hydroxide. Minus one, is that formula balanced? Yes. Phase on that one? It's a little bit trickier. You really want to say water's dissolved in water? We're not going to say aqueous, but we'll stick with liquid. liquid. There's one of our phase changes on that. So some of them you're kind of expected to know. OK, some things that we want to address. Number one, because you're already calling me out on it, H2O versus HOH. Why did I write it as HOH? Because it's what? Hydroxide. Why am I calling out hydroxide? I'm trying to match the double replacement format so that I see how it exchanges better. If I write H2O, we probably come into an issue. This two starts to look an awful lot like this two. Why is there a two with the hydrogen and sulfuric acid? To balance the hydrogen with Sulfate. Why is there a 2 in H2O? We can come up with a couple options. We can say it's to balance the oxygen. Okay? Or we can say it's because there's two hydrogens in the formula of H2O. It's not technically ionic. Okay? So I pull it out as HOH to make sure that I can see that double replacement reaction happen a little bit cleaner and to make sure I don't swap those coefficients across. Is the equation balanced? What do I need to do? Okay. And? Is there an and? Yeah, there's an Two in front of the HOH. Okay. There's my balanced equation. Yippee. 
Okay. Uh, you may see combustion reactions pop up. <coughs> Combustions are the reaction of an organic material, carbons and hydrogens, with oxygen to produce CO2 and water. I'm not too concerned about it because it really doesn't show up all that often, so we'll not stress about it right now. What we really want to address here is what's happening in Chapter 8 and ultimately Chapter 9. Okay. Let's actually step back from Chapter 8 for a moment and jump all the way to Chapter 9. What does Chapter 9 give me information about? Because you all read ahead, right? Chemical equation calculations. Chemical equation calculations. The most important aspect of this is stuff that we already know okay, or that you already have kind of thought about, you just not have, may not have quantified it into an equation. If I give you one H2SO4, how many KOHs do you need to react with it? Two. How do you know it's two? Because it doesn't balance out if you don't use two. There's a reason we have those numbers in front. Those numbers refer to how many of each of those need to react. If I give you two H2SO4s, how many KOHs? How'd you do that calculation? Two H2SO4 needs to equal some number of KOHs. What are we doing? We're changing the unit. H2SO4 will address that. KOH. What number shows up in front of KOH? What number shows up in front of H2SO4? One. From our balanced equation. It's okay. What happens? We end up with our final answer of four KOHs coming out of that. We're using a conversion factor that comes out of the equation. That's what the numbers in front give you. Very, very, very helpful. Okay. It allows you to convert from one species to the other. That's chapter 9. What chapter 8 is talking about is what is the unit associated with each of those substances. Well, in one case, we could look at it as molecules. There's an issue with the number of molecules. How small is a molecule? Very, very tiny. When you go into the lab, are you measuring out one molecule and reacting it with one molecule? <coughs> You're reacting probably trillions of molecules with trillions of molecules. It would be a bit excessive to take our equation. Instead of putting one in front, I said we had one trillion. How many zeros is that? Let's just say it's that. Then I'd have to go through. I don't know. Let's, let's not focus on the number of zeros. Okay. To go through and balance the equation, I have to change those numbers a lot. So what we end up changing these to is now looking at our reactions, instead of being the number of molecules, we reference it as a number of moles. All the mole is is a massive number of molecules. Okay. Let's say you have a hard time counting above 10. When you go to the store and somebody tells you to buy 12 eggs, how do you count them if you can't count above 10? Don't. What you can end up doing is saying 10 and 2 is a dozen. So now someone says to get 120 eggs. You could go through and count each of those 120 eggs, but that's too many fingers. You don't have 100, what did I say? 20 fingers. Okay. So what you could do is group them by 12s and say instead of getting 120 eggs, you get 10 dozen eggs. A mole is a dozen. Exact same concept. Right? All we're doing is trying to come up with a conversion factor. We will pick up there on whatever next week is. <laughs>